Hello everyone. Uh, so this will be your last section for the semester. This will be unit four, section number four. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this section is very long, uh, long kind of materials that we're going to discuss. Uh, but I will try to do it uh, very uh, briefly and conceptually as much as possible. So your worksheet uh, related to this uh, section will be mostly about geometrical optics, uh, although I'm going to talk about radioactive materials a little bit at the end of the section, but make sure that you uh, uh, watch the video and also uh, read the material on the textbook and also uh, get uh, read uh, the slides a little bit to get uh, more understanding about uh, those uh, things. Okay, so now in this uh, section, we're going to uh, focus into chapter um, 24, 25, and also chapter 31. Those are the sections that we're going to, chapters that combine into uh, this section. Okay. So now we're going to start with uh, chapter 24 and 25 first, and then we're going to move into the uh, next content uh, later on. So now in this part, uh, we're going to discuss about electromagnetic waves and also uh, light waves is an electromagnetic wave and how we see the things like objects, how do we see from our eyes? And then what are the, what are the optical devices that we have? Plain mirrors, spherical mirrors and lenses we have, we're going to discuss about those and get an understanding how to get the location of the image and how some of them magnify, why some of them are not magnifying and those kind of things. And uh, then finally, I will move into uh, radioactivity, a little bit about alpha, beta, gamma uh, rays, and then nuclear fission and fusion. We know that the, the uh, nuclear bomb will belong to nuclear fission, and nuclear fusion is important part uh, of the uh, living uh, sun and stars on the sky. Okay, so uh, first thing is electromagnetic waves. So electromagnetic waves is belong to this whole spectrum that we can see some of the rays, we are not able to see some of them. So the rays that we can see, we call it as visible light, that's this range, right? That's the colors of the rainbow from uh, red to uh, color violet. We can uh, see from our eyes, that is the visible range. And in addition to that, this range will be staying in around 400 to 700 nanometers in wavelength. Okay, that's the visible range. And in addition to that, uh, there are two axes in this my chart. Uh, one is wavelength and the other one is the frequency. You need to observe that you see that my wavelength is very, very small in here, but my frequency axis is great. Because you remember that in your earlier section, about the uh, sound waves, we discuss about the velocity of any wave is equal frequency times wavelength. But when we come to this section, we are talking about electromagnetic waves. Because of that, your velocity is the same for all the electromagnetic wave. That is speed, we call it as speed of light. Speed of light is around three times 10 to the power eight, right? That's the constant. And so now what you can see in this formula, when frequencies increase, your wavelength should be decreased. That's why these two are staying like that. When the wavelength is greater, frequency is uh, smaller, right? So now in this spectrum, you have many, many things. So one thing I have it all the way right, gamma rays. Gamma rays are dangerous wave that, that has very high frequency and very low wavelength. So now gamma rays usually used in medical applications to uh, kill the cancer cells and those things, right? And then gamma rays uh, will be CT scans. Uh, I mean, X-rays will be CT scans, uh, X-rays that you're going to take it in your uh, doctor office. This will be belong to somewhere in this uh, range of uh, frequency and the wavelength. And then ultraviolet is not a dangerous wave, but it is little danger than the other violet. That's why sometimes you will get the skin burns uh, because of the ultraviolet. Ultraviolet, we have many other medical uh, uh, application and advantages that you can uh, take a look on the, your textbook. And next wave, uh, the other side of our spectrum, uh, visible spectrum is infrared. 
So infrared is the um, wave that uh, like a heat waves, although we do not see it uh, when you uh, close to uh, close to the oven that you are cooking, you feel the heat because of the uh, infrared. And also like uh, night vision cameras and astronomy, uh, uh, the observations, we use the infrared for those uh, kind of uh, applications. And then radio waves, we all know, and microwaves, we all know. So those will be uh, uh, the safe side of the spectrum of uh, electromagnetic waves. Okay. So now um, colors that we know that we can see the colors, range of colors, visible spectrum, but combination of this, all the colors together, we call it as white light. That's why you will see the sunlight as white because it has all the colors that we have, red, blue, green, and those all the colors together, then your white will really stay in here. This is the mix of all of them, mixed. So uh, that is the white color you will see. And uh, red, uh, blue, and green are mentioned as primary colors. Other all are corresponding to other colors. We call it as complementary colors, okay? And now, uh, why we see the objects? There are two methods we can see the object. One thing is, if I have a light on the ceiling, my eyes can directly uh, see the light because of the light source, right? That is one way you can see the things. In addition to that, uh, when I switch on the light on the dark room, I will be able to see the items inside that room. So why I see it? Because the light uh, produced from the uh, light bulb will hit the objects and then come back to my eye because of that I am going to see the things. So that is because of the reflection. So those are the two methods we can see the objects, right? So now when you see the objects, we're going to focus into ray model, ray model or geometrical optics. That means uh, basically we are talking about the light travel as a straight uh, line. Although light is a wave, in this uh, assume, within this assumption that we're going to consider or draw the things by just using an uh, arrow and the line to represent the light. Okay, so now when the light uh, will uh, will come in from the pencil to your eye, then you're going to see that place of the pencil. So a lot of light rays come into your eye by hitting from the other places. Then you're going to see the uh, pencil. Right, and uh, light. Uh, the when the sunlight come to the uh, earth, that we know that atmospheric particle we have in the air particle everywhere. Those air particles first uh, will be hitting from the sunlight, and then those light will be scattered. Right, so this is we call it as the uh, Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh scattering. Electromagnetic waves uh, will hit the. Uh, air particle, then they will scattered, uh, the, uh, scatter the lights. So we call it as the uh, Rayleigh scattering. So now you can think different thing. Why uh, sky is blue? Why when the sunrise and uh, sunset, you will see red kind of sky and those things. Okay. So now this everything is the spectrum that how light will uh, be scattered, right? So uh, you see that in the wavelength range, I have the uh, blue light somewhere around 400 here and red light is somewhere around this uh, area, right? So when the uh, sunlight uh, is scattered uh, off from the air particle, so blue light is scattered more than the other colors uh, because of that, you will see sky is blue. Blue will scatter more in the uh, Rayleigh scattering. When the sunlight comes, so we know that the sunlight is scattered off uh, from the molecule of the air, then the uh, blue light will be scattered more than any other light colors you have it in your uh, spectrum. So the uh, sky appear for us to as blue because of that, scattered more, right? But uh, why uh, in sunset and sunrise, we will see the uh, uh, kind of yellowish or red, reddish color of uh, sky. 
So that reason is actually still blue light will be scattered, but when the sun goes from uh, not on the top, now sun is sitting somewhere here when sunset or sunrise, then the, when the person sitting here, although your blue light is scattered more, blue light going to be scattered outside, but direct the light you will see will be red light coming from the uh, that uh, because uh, your sun is in sunset and sunrise that is the end of the uh, your vision area that you can see right but the daytime your sun is all the all the way on your top of the head because of that directly uh, more scattered light uh, come to your eyes because of that you will see the uh, blue Okay, so I, uh, yeah, I have the diagram in here, what is actually happening, right? So when sunset, I have a red light directly uh, coming to the, your eyes. Okay, so now uh, we uh, little understand it. So now why uh, the uh, clouds white? Why we see the clouds white? So now light of the sun is combination of all the colors as we discussed, right? So combination of all the colors uh, will create basically a kind of uh, white light. The, so sun appear yellow color because uh, it uh, send out more yellow uh, light than the any other colors. Clouds usually reflect all the colors, the exact same amount as they look white, right? Because of uh, that. Okay, so now uh, okay, so reflection and image formation by using plane mirror. So now first thing we're going to learn is the uh, plane mirror. So plane mirror, everybody have that in your uh, bathrooms. So we know that uh, plane mirror will create a image that when you go in front of the mirror, you will see yourself inside the mirror. Right, that is called it as the uh, plane mirror. So now, before moving into that, let's discuss uh, law of reflection. Law of reflection. So law of reflection is uh, showing you law of reflection. So now it says very simple law. It says that if any light hit the any kind of media, that light will going to reflect. That means if I have a page that has the light uh, hit on that plane, this one, I have the page and then light hit in this uh, surface and then that light should be reflect back. So that reflect back has a rule that we call it as the reflection law. So that says that if you are angle of incident, that means this angle, that should be equal to the angle of reflection. So that is, we call it as the reflection law. But what is the incident angle? It's very important that you need to measure your angle, that incident ray with respect to your normal to the surface. That means you need to draw a perpendicular line to the surface and then take the angle of incident and take the angle of refraction with respect to your normal axis, right? So now these two are equal to each other. That is called it as law of reflection. No, no. So now if you have uh, F in front of the mirror, you know how it will create. You basically create exactly same distance F is start here, but you're going to see the mirror image of that. You're going to see this kind of uh, pattern of the uh, F because of the uh, uh, rays that we discussed, right? So I know that my slide has uh, cut in the top. Uh, it says uh, formation of image by using spherical mirrors. So mirrors are not always uh, plain mirrors. You have uh, mirrors that have kind of spherical shapes that can have uh, convex mirrors and that can have concave mirrors. So concave mirrors basically caved toward the object, right? That means if I have object in here, it is, you see that curved towards the object, right? So now convex mirrors call it as flex out from the object. That means you have object uh, in here, your mirror is flex out 
from the object. So now because of this shape of the mirror, your reflection rule that we learn, you need to draw it, your perpendicular axis will be actually to the center. This one is go to the center and then you measure the incident and refraction. Not like plane mirror, right? Plane mirror does not have the uh, center. Plane mirror is basically a plane that does not have the uh, center, right? So now uh, image formation, first thing that we need to learn is if your uh, mirror is concave mirror in here, concave because you have uh, caved towards the object. So now we're going to learn a little bit about this uh, information about the focal point. So focal point of the mirror is Basically, if you send parallel light to the mirror, that all the lights will come or overlap into one place. That place we call it as a focal point or focus point. That means if I send the light that you can see these all are parallel lights, then when they hit the mirror, it will obey the your uh, reflection law. That means your incident angle equal three friction angle, then your all the rays will be coincide into that place. That is, we call it as the focal point. Now, distance from your mirror to this point, we call it as focal distance. Okay. So usually for the spherical mirrors, your focal distance will be then that means radius r divide by two radius is this distance that will be the distance from center of this mirror to the mirror okay so now this is actually piece of your circle because this if you like complete this circuit it's a circle it's a very big circle this is where the center is if you take the uh, drawing tools you can draw a whole big circle that will be whole mirror but your mirror is just a part of that circle or arc of your circle, right? So uh, R will be divided by two. So now formation of image by using concave mirrors. We have it in here, I don't want to draw it. So first way that you can draw it will be, if you have an object, we'll say I have object in here, right? So that object will send the rays. If you send it parallel rays, this ray always go through the focal point. That is, we call it as number one ray that you can draw easily, right? And second ray will be exactly opposite of that. That means if you send a light to the focal point, that light will be reflect back parallel to the axis. That is the second ray, right? And there is third and fourth. And third one is, uh, if you send a light, light go through the center. So that means this light. If you have the object in here, I have a source. I'm going to send the light through the object to the center that will reflect back exactly on top of that. That is third one. And the fourth one, actually, I don't have it in here. Fourth one is actually, if you send the light, I'm going to draw it in this diagram. If you send the light, to the, this vertex point of the mirror, this will be reflect back exactly with your refraction, reflection law by taking this angle and this angle equal. That will be the uh, fourth one, okay? So now there are four rays, right? You don't want four of them to find the location. So find the location is basically in first diagram, in the second diagram, this will be where your image, this is, is your object. You start from there, this is going to end up. And this one is where you start and this is you going to end up, right? So, but we need only two rays. We don't want four of them, but four rays, is, four rays are known that you can use any of two, uh, uh, whichever you select okay so uh, we're going to draw some of them uh, in your recitation session and I have some of the examples uh, in a minute but uh, drawing is one tool and next tool is calculation calculation or drawing both should agree uh, together right in the calculation we have very simple equation which is written in here 
So 1 over di, 1 over di means basically distance from mirror to the object, right? Mirror to the object. Wherever you have your object, this distance from here to here is d naught, right? Distance from mirror to your image location is di. Distance from mirror to focal point is f. All the measurements I am taking is from the uh, your vertex point of the mirror. So in this case, no direction. We are not working with vectors. We are working with just numbers, but you're going to measure it from the uh, difference between your uh, mirror place and the uh, object image and the focal point. So then uh, by using this equation, you can calculate di if you want, if you know the do and the f. If you know the other things, you can calculate the whatever uh, unknown. But my next concept is calculating of magnification. Magnification is how large you will see. So as example, if you go to the bathroom, you may get the 3x mirrors, you get the 8x mirrors. That means basically how uh, big it would compare to your real size. That is called it as the magnification. So now magnification is, we'll be able to calculate. Again, you can draw it, measure the height, but it is hard because of that. In analytically, we can calculate the magnification. M is for the magnification, M, right? M will be height of the object image divided by height of the object. Height of the object is here. Height of the image is here, right? HI divided by H naught, that is one way. And another way that will be exactly equal to negative di divided by d naught, image distance divided by object distance. This will be a formula that you can use to calculate the magnification. One of that will be uh, enough for you to calculate the magnification. So now uh, we are working with the concave mirror, caved towards the object. So now you can keep the object in different places. You see that in my top diagram, I have object far away from the focal point. And then bottom diagram, I have object at exactly center of the mirror. So now where you keep the object will be different places for the image location. Right, take a look by drawing the diagram in here. So you send the your first ray, you're going to take it. Mm, parallel rays should go through the focal point. That is number one we discuss. And I need another one. So I draw the second ray, go through the focal point, that will be reflected back. So now you will see your connect of this blue, uh, green, and the red one is somewhere in between uh, 2F and F. This is where you're going to locate your image. That is first one. And second one I have exactly on the uh, center. Now see what will happen when you have the object at the center. So parallel rays, that is number one. And this is number two. And it will create exactly image uh, in inverted, uh, but exactly same location. So that is when you have object at the center. But your object can be in between center and F, or it can be on this uh, F, or it can be uh, another example, you can bring closer to the mirror than the focal point. Now, this is very special case. Take a look what will happen. First ray, and I extended that. And second ray, they will never meet in left side, but if I extended, those will meet in the right side. So now it's very important in this case, you are seeing magnified object exactly same way, same orientation as you have. So this is a magnifying uh, mirror that you can use, right? So now uh, I show you very special things in those diagrams. So everything that I have drawn in earlier, those cases are basically a uh, connection of uh, your real light will create the image. Those are, we call it as real image. But in this case, on the last case, I make an image by extending light, dotted, dotted lines. Because of that, this image is actually virtual. Similar to your plane mirror, the image that you can see inside the mirror is virtual. It is not real, right? That kind of image, we call it as virtual image. That means no connection of real light. Those are extended light. 
So now final conclusion from this all this I put it into everything together that by changing the position of the object, you will see the image in different places if it is a concave mirror. So now you think about that your instructor bring the uh, mirror in front of you sitting on the instructor desk and uh, your instructor plan to move towards you, then you will going to see different uh, different uh, image, different size image, inverted one, and same size one, bigger images, you're going to see different things because your concave mirror uh, working like that. Have image a little further away, you draw the two rays that you learn, first one and then second one. So then your image location is exactly same diagram that I uh, tried to draw in the earlier screen. So now uh, let's take another example. Draw the first ray and draw the second one. It's still the same, nothing changed. And third one, so the ray is still the same, right? So important thing that you will realize in here in uh, your convex mirrors, you're going to see the image is exactly for forming in between focal point and the length, uh, focal point and the uh, mirror that will be always in your uh, this side, right? And always it is a virtual image, always it is a smaller in size, always it is upright, same orientation as it is, that is called it as upright orientation. So this will be the same for everywhere you keep the object, nothing change. Basically, it will just go back and forth a little bit closer to the, this point. Other than that, nothing change. So now, if somebody bring the uh, convex mirror close to you, you you don't see any difference. You just see it's the same image going up and down. So other than that, nothing will change. Okay. So now <clears throat> about the mirrors that we discuss, it's very important concept uh, that focal point that we discuss on concave mirror and convex mirror. You remember that uh, concave mirror, uh, you had the this this kind you have the this no, you have the other convex sorry you have the other one. Let me change the color also. So concave one, you have the mirror like this, right? This side is uh, your plated side. You're going to keep the object on this side. So now in this case, your focal point will be this side too. Because of that, it is a positive focal point uh, for concave mirrors. But convex mirrors, you have a focal point. This way is the mirror is. Then focal point is somewhere here. You're going to call it the object somewhere here. Then in this case, your focal point uh, have no rays because of that, that will be a negative. Value. So focal point is negative for the uh, convex mirrors, but concave mirrors, it is positive. And in addition to that, this is always virtual any and reduced on the convex, but concave mirror, you can have enlarged uh, image, you can have smaller image, you have negative values, positive values, anything is possible in uh, concave mirror. Okay, so now we're going to move into uh, index of uh, refraction. So now index of refraction important, we're going to move into the refraction now. We talk about the reflection, that means we are done with the mirrors. We're going to move into uh, lenses now. So now uh, index of refraction is uh, material property that when the light hit some kind of material, uh, that refraction of that light, not the reflection, reflection is coming back, but refraction is transmit to the uh, media. So in that case, that there is a property of the material that will affect to this transmission, how much that light bend and those things, that is called it as refractive index. There is no units for the refractive index. Definition of that will be ratio of speed of light to uh, speed of light in the media. Speed of light in the uh, vacuum is the C. Speed of light in the media is V. So you can always see this C is always greater than the V because of that N should be always greater than one. So they cannot have negative numbers for the end. <clears throat> so now usually vacuum, C and V are the same, right? Because of that, 
refractive index will be one. But any other materials you have refractive index greater than one. Okay. So now uh, we already finished with this one free uh, flexion. So now we're going to move into the refraction. So now refraction ray is here. So this is your incident ray. This is your refracted ray. So now uh, there is very important thing in happening in here. So if you are N2, this, these are the refractive index that I am talking because water have higher refractive index than the air. So now if light travel to the higher refractive media, then your light will bend in towards the normal. You see, bend in towards the normal. Bend in towards the normal, right? That means if you have higher refractive index on the second media. But if you have lower refractive index in the second media, just switch the light source now in the, air, uh, the uh, water. So now your light is bending outward from the normal. When second media is lower refractive index, your light is bending out. What is the bending in and bending out means? So this is your direct light, right? This is direct light will be going this way. It is bending towards the normal. This is where the direct light is. It's bending outward from the normal. That is what the bending inward and outward means, okay? So now uh, we are ready to discuss about refraction uh, law. So reflection law was very simple. Refraction law is, we call it as Snell's law sometime, this equation. What that means is you start with first media, take the angle of sine with, again, with respect to normal axis. That is very important. You always measure the angle with respect to your a perpendicular line that you draw in the media. So times sine theta one equal into times sine of theta two, that is the second media, right? Then you will be able to calculate your angle or, uh, refractive index as you need for the uh, problem solving, okay? That's called as Snell's law. So now uh, application of refraction uh, is actually uh, important. So the rainbows that we can see happening because of the refraction of the light on the uh, water droplets, right? You can see the lights will refract in the water droplets then why I can see different colors. Different colors can happen, not even rainbow, that can happen when the light refracts through the glass kind of media. You may have seen it in your window, in your uh, automo automobile or somewhere that when you travel in the car, right? So this light bending, colors bending feature, we call it as chromatic dispersion, chromatic dispersion. Chromatic dispersion means basically white light is separate into different colors and bending into different angles. That is called it as chromatic dispersion. So it is important that this dispersion is happening according to the speed of these different colors light. So usually uh, red color is very close to the speed of the light. Red is the fastest light that can travel because of that red always is stay very close to your direct light you see very close to direct light right so more bending happen for the uh, blue light blue is more bending because it is a uh, slower motion of the uh, light okay so now same reason when you go to the rainbow that you're going to see the spectrum because your light will hit the rainbow, that water droplet, water droplet and the air, there is a refraction happening. Then you're going to see the colors of the rainbow around 42 degrees, including all the way bottom, you're going to see uh, violet and all the way top, you're going to see the red, okay? So now sometimes you may see, uh, double rainbow or secondary uh, rainbow other than the primary one. When you see the secondary uh, rainbow, you're going to see around it in 52 degrees. Uh, uh, that is less intense than the uh, this visibility is less, intensity is less. And, uh, but you will see the color switch on the rainbow. So next time take a look when you see the rainbow. So first rainbow is the sun, all the way bottom purple on the top, red, but secondary rainbow start with the red and ending with the uh, purple. 
Okay, that's because the reason is this uh, bending of light features that happen in here and happen in the next uh, rain. I'm going to move into the lenses. Uh, take a break when you watch the video because this is a long video. Okay, and uh, now we're going to move into the lenses. So lens will be a piece of glass basically. So that means I do not have a mirror, but what I have is a glass piece that can have it in different shapes, right? So uh, those we call it as the the small thickness lenses. We call it as thin lenses. So in uh, our class, we're going to focus into converging and diverging lenses only. That means this is, we call it as converging lens. Some people call it as double convex lens, but I like to use the converging because it will converge the light. And the other mirror that we have is the diverging mirror, diverging, uh, sorry, lens we are talking. Diverging lens will be, looks like, we're going to discuss that later. Diverging mirror will be, looks like this. This kind of uh, lens, we call it as diverging lens, okay? Okay, let's move into the converging lens first. So now, uh, you remember that by using mirrors, we discuss about the focal point and then lenses also should have a focal point. You measure it with respect to your uh, lens position or vertex point. So, but the lenses are different because you can send the light from one side and that light go to the other side also. One side to other side. It's not reflect back. It is going through, transmit. Right. So because of that, we need to use the refraction uh, law. So now if you send the parallel light to the lens, those all the light focus into the other side of the lens. That point, we call it as focal point. Distance from lens to point is the uh, focal length, okay, as usual. So now um, drawing converging uh, lens ray diagram again will help for us to understand the location of the image and size of the image. So for lenses, it will be easier than the mirrors. Again, you need only two rays, although we're going to discuss three rays in here. So first one is you're going to draw a ray that go parallel to the axis that should go through the focal point. Now remember that what happened in the mirrors that bent towards the focal point on that side. But converging lenses are not like that. Lenses can be able to send the light into the other side because of that I do have two focal point exactly same distance. It's very important that you label the important focal point on the lens. For converging lens, my focal point is other side of the lens. Okay. So now that will be my first ray. And in addition to that, I have another focal point here and two centers because of these two curved surfaces. I should have two focal points and two centers. Okay. So now second ray, exactly same thing as mirrors. You're going to send the light through the focal point on the same side as the lens. And that ray will go parallel to the axis into the other side. Then you find the image location some here. That is second ray. And third one is more simpler. Third one is if you send the light to exactly to the vertex point in here, that the center of the lens, that will directly go to the, as a direct light pass through to the other side. That will be the third one. So now any of these three rays, any two of these three rays will be useful for to identify the location of the image and the size of the image. So now uh, let's draw some of them to get an understanding. So first one, sending light parallel to the axis. I have my object somewhere in here this time. It is far away from center of the object, the, the object location. So first ray and then second ray, I found the image location that's created on the other side. Okay, keep watching. So now I have second one, second diagram. Uh, now my object is exactly at the center. 2F means radius uh, distance. And then first ray and second ray, it will create the image exactly same distance, but the opposite side and inverted image. Okay. And now keep moving. You bring the object in between focal point and the center and then draw it. And then you find the image. I have three of drawing there. 
image in larger size, but inverted on the other side. And then next one, I have a focal point place. You remember in concave mirror, when the object is in focal point, there is no image. In this case, it will be similar case. So no image, okay, no image when the object is in focal point. And then next one is object is very close to the lens. So draw in first one and second one. So now you see the image created in larger in size, same side. And, but those are virtual. This is the only case that you will see the virtual. Everything that you see it in everywhere else are real, real rays. This is the only virtual case when the object is in between F and the lens. You will see, you can use it as magnifying glass. Okay. Okay, so we discuss all of them, but important thing is this is a converging lenses similar to your concave mirror. Uh, it will keep change in the direction, keep change in the size, keep change in the location of the image according to the location of the object. So that's important. Okay, so now uh, diverging lens is the next one. Diverging lens has the shape like diverge, right? It's called diverging because light will diverge in this case. What is happening is when you send the light to the uh, this lens, your light will diverge in here, not converge in this direction as converging lens. Then you have important focal point on the same side as the uh, object. That's the difference. Converging lens, your important focal point sitting on the right side of the uh, lens if you start on the left side. But this one, your object is left side and your focal point, important focal point is also left side. I have a focal point on the other side, but important one is on the left side. So now drawing for the uh, diverging lens, exactly the same three rays. We can draw first ray uh, like a parallel ray to the axis. That it will not allow me to change the colors. Uh, give me a second. So parallel rays is the first one, this ray, right? So this ray is the first one go and hit, and then it's going to re going to refract to the other side, but by going through the focal point. Those are dotted lines. So it's like going through the focal point and go to the uh, transmit into the other side. And second ray, if you send the light to the uh, lens, but direction to the your focal point on the other side, it's going to go as a parallel to the eye, right? And then third ray will be going through the center. It is exactly the same as earlier. Now, this is where that you're going to watch the things. You're going to see your image in somewhere here. Okay, three rays. So uh, now let's take a couple of examples. I have object further away. Then you draw your first ray, extend the line, second ray parallel to the axis, extend that line. Then you find the location of the image. This is virtual image because it is extended light. Okay. And now let's go to this one. I have object in 2F, that means center of the lens, first ray, second ray, and is still creating the image on that lens, right? It's still virtual. And third one, exactly in between 2F and F, you still you have image in between F and the lens. And then at F, also create the image, and closer to F also will create the image, right? That means for the diverging lens, similar to your convex mirror, it will have restricted area that can create the uh, image okay so now your all the image will be very closer to the each other uh, wherever you keep the object it will always create virtual smaller in size and upright image for the diverging lens okay, okay so now uh, this formula that we learn uh, for mirrors going to still work for the lenses same formula only different uh, for the converging and diverging, similar to concave and convex, uh, diverging lens, your focal point is negative. For diverging, F is negative.
I think I have it in next slide, diverging, for diverging, right? But for converging lens, it is a positive. Okay, so magnification equation is still the same. Uh, in addition to that, we can calculate the power if you want. Power equal one over the focal point of the lens. It's a very simple formula. But this is what uh, the what I'm trying to say. Diverging lens focal point can be negative, always negative. A converging lens focal point is always positive. Now, converging lens you can have in large image, you can have a smaller one, you can have virtual, real, depending on where is your object location is. But Divergent lens, it is restricted to the image, which is virtual and always smaller in size and always upright. Okay, I think uh, we're good with that, right? So now, um, what are the applications we have? So concave mirror, convex mirrors, we have all the applications that we use uh, concave mirrors many of the times to enlarge the image. Uh, like uh, magnifying uh, mirrors and so on. So convex mirrors we use for the rear view uh, mirrors in the cars because we need to see the same direction. We don't want to see upside down, smaller in size, larger in size images when the car coming on the back side. We just need to watch what is behind us or what is the side by us. So that convex mirror is good enough for that. And also when you go to the shopping complex, you're going to see the mirrors. Those mirrors will be again convex mirrors because we need the uh, orientation of the image exactly same. We are not worrying about the size or orientation uh, created by converging or concave mirrors. And uh, converging lens and diverging lens, we always know that we have a lot of uh, application in optical devices, cameras, um, a microscope, telescope, even your eye has these lenses, right? So those are the applications, especially in the eye. Uh, there are two accommodations usually people have. One is nearsightedness, other one is farsightedness. Nearsightedness means basically uh, you can see the near, you cannot see the faraway object. So farsightedness means you can see the faraway object, but not the near object. So what is happening actually in the eye, you know that we have uh, lens kind of things in uh, here, and then we have a screen on the back. So you need to focus whatever you see seen from your eye to the screen, uh, to see it exactly. So this seems like you are focusing not the screen little before that. That is, we call it as nearsightedness. And some people will focus out of the screen. That is, we call it as farsightedness. So now, according to this accommodation, we need to use the different glasses. So this one, I need to basically convert, con, um, diverge of the uh, uh, rays to make it to this place because I need to not to converge, I need to expand it a little bit. Because of that, we're going to use the diverging lens for that recommendation. And far sideness, we're going to use the converging lens because I need to converge more to the screen that we can accommodate by using converging lens. And uh, we can have both of them. So top part, bottom part of the UI glasses, you're going to use uh, lenses uh, to accommodate uh, combination of those uh, problems. Um, I will take uh, probably uh, five or six minutes, uh, very briefly. Uh, X-rays and radioactive, this is your chapter 31 that I'm going to basically discuss very simple uh, information. So Rohanjan is the scientist that who discovered the X-rays uh, that we can discovered uh, by using high voltage uh, the, the tube, uh, discharge tube by sending the electrons through the tube. So now uh, usually X-rays will pass through the uh, bodies, even living things, uh, X-rays can pass through and will create a kind of image uh, that will be something like this, right? Soft uh, tissues, uh, X-rays will pass through and create this kind of image that is we call it as the X-ray that can be able to see the broken uh, bones and those things, right? 
so uh, radioactivity is actually uh, dangerous. Even X-ray, gamma ray, those everything are not good for us. But radioactivity is actually natural. That even in outside, when you are sitting in this uh, outside, you are exposed to uh, the radiation uh, always. Right? It is a natural thing that is coming from the environment. But in addition to that, uh, there are some uh, dangerous sources uh, that will create the uh, radioactive uh, elements. Okay? Uh, in radioactive uh, uh, elements, uh, usually divide or emit as three types of radiation. One is the alpha ray. Alpha ray, we call it as the positive charge helium atom. So that will be basically this one, right? And then beta ray, we call it as a negative charge electron that will be uh, beta rays. So now alpha rays and beta rays are not that much danger, but the gamma ray is the next one, which is very, very uh, dangerous uh, for uh, living uh, organisms. So uh, gamma rays will be basically um, high electromagnetic radiation that we discuss on the spectrum, you remember, right? So uh, how to understand which one is danger, uh, you can uh, think prob probably how they penetrate through the things, right? As example, gamma ray, the alpha ray, sorry, alpha ray is not uh, penetrated penetrating through our body. Alpha ray is basically uh, even uh, the paper is the one that can uh, probably absorb the alpha ray. Paper ray. Papers can basically block the alpha ray. So that means it is not danger. But uh, beta rays will be able to block shield by using aluminum foil. It's not danger either, but the uh, gamma ray actually going everywhere that we cannot uh, shield it unless we have uh, lead that the element, you remember that atomic uh, uh, table that we discussed about the lead, like a lead we need to uh, block that ray. Uh, it is not easy to use the lead shielding for everywhere that we have those things. But this very, uh, high radioactive materials are actually covered by the lead in the laboratories. Otherwise, they will emit the radiation uh, that will uh, uh, kill our organisms, uh, cells, and those things. Uh, you probably hear about the uh, Marie Curie, right? So uh, she is the one who uh, basically uh, develop a lot of radioactive elements uh, is still uh, her papers that notebook have it on the uh, museum. Uh, is still danger. So, so it, that kind of danger after many, many years. Okay. And uh, this is the doses of the radiation. Uh, definitely, X rays has the radiation, uh, but uh, the uh, like poor flower plants or uh, some TV uh, tubes, we have very low kind of radiations. Uh, basically, uh, holes. Uh, atoms or the your, uh, particles together. So when it is very small nucleus, that will be very strong than the uh, big nucleus because you can see the radius is getting larger that they can easily apart, uh, but the smaller one is very, very uh, more effectively strong, right? So now um, I will definitely skip a couple of them. And here, uh, radioactive lifetime. As an uh, example, if you have radioactive element, that element going to be decayed. That means if you have one kilogram lead, so after some years, it's going to be half a kilogram. So that kind of decay, we call it as the uh, radioactive decay. So that time will take, we call it as half life how much it will turn into the half of the uh, amount, then time it will take, we call it as the half time of the uh, material. Now, when it turn into half time, so when it go into many, many years, as example, uranium-238 is very uh, dangerous uh, radioactive material that will turn into the lead after uh, many, many years, that 4.5 billion years, okay? that kind of things. And radiation uh, elements are using for the uh, detectors that we have radiation detectors. Uh, we can have Geiger-Miller counters, you can see. And we have uh, scintillation uh, counters. And we have cloud chambers. And we have bubble chambers. The different uh, 
uh, instruments, uh, we use this kind of radiation uh, detectors uh, to detect how much it uh, radioactive and those things. Okay. And nuclear fusion and fission, uh, very briefly, uh, nuclear fusion is basically your single nucleus, you're going to uh, destroy that nucleus and create a new kind of uh, nucleus. We call it as nuclear fission. fusion. So uh, nuclear uh, fission, actually this name should be nuclear fission, not the fusion. So give me a second, this is wrong. This should be fission, okay? Nuclear fission. And that is called it as a nuclear fission. You uh, divide your single nucleus into small pieces. By doing this, uh, you can create a new uh, chemical formula that will be basically the physics behind the uh, nuclear bomb. Okay, so you can uh, uh, get the nuclear bomb, nuclear fission fish uh, fish uh, fish reactors, uh, and power plants. We have application of nuclear fission. You divide your big nuclei into a small uh, nucleus. Okay. And the nuclear fusion is next one. Nuclear fusion is a smaller nuclei. You're going to connect into the big one. That is called it as nuclear fusion. So nuclear fusion uh, is um, also very important, like it starts and our sun uh, live there because of uh, the uh, there is a nuclear uh, fusion happening inside the uh, those stars and the suns. So that's we call it as nuclear. Uh, fusion. Okay, so I will stop here. So this will be end of your semester and I wish you uh, best of luck and uh, for everything and I hope you had a very great semester. Thank you.